So we have uh, finished four weeks of discussions on the gospel. And I had a free Sunday. Uh, I didn't have any requirements on what I needed to say. So I chose to kind of do a wrap up uh, in Mike's version of a wrap up, which is different than probably Paul or Jeremy's. Um, so we talked about why the gospel was worth living, why the gospel was worth dying for, why the gospel was worth uh, dying or sharing. What was the second one? Defending, defending. <laughs> Philippians, it's defending the gospel. Uh, yes, so I should have known that. Um, so anyway, uh, what I would like to do today is get my PowerPoint up there. There it is. Uh, and look at it from an analysis side of it. So many of you don't know who I am. Uh, I'm an engineer by trade, uh, and I'm also the, uh, related to the president, the, the, Pacific Bible College, so I teach theology, so I have kind of a unique uh, perspective on things. But what I want to do is begin our discussion today with analysis of how is the American Evangelical Church doing when it comes to living out the gospel. And there's two primary um, surveys that I will be researching and sharing you, with you the results. And so we'll go through this analysis stage and then we'll step into an exhortation stage where um, worldview will be key. And you'll hear that term multiple times. And the actual, the slide that you're looking at is uh, chosen to replicate or to, to portray graphically uh, the previous slide, the, the slide you had, that one. Uh, what a worldview does. So all of us, as we will discuss, have uh, a worldview, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But without Christ or before Christ, in a sense, it's black because it has been developed from everything in this world. And this world is filled with ideologies and things like that that are from the ruler of this world, which is Satan. So these are Satan's lies that we have adopted into our worldview. The white line that tears through it is obviously reflective of the gospel. And each of us is tasked with the deconstruction and the reconstruction of our worldview so that it changes slowly over time, become more and more white and more and more of a biblical worldview. So now you can change the. Uh, slide. So this may seem like an odd place to start, but I think it is such a stark reminder to us on two fronts. One, that we live in a broken world and we're sinners, and this is our destiny. Secondly, as Christians, this is not permanent. This is a transition into a better life. And I want us to remember that theologically as we go through this. This concept of death to life is rooted in the gospel, and it's certainly rooted in, in the life and person of Jesus. It's also rooted in every human culture that has ever existed. Every human culture has their version of a graveyard. We have consistently honored and memorialized our dead. Which, if you are familiar with evolution and Darwin theory and all of these anti-creation theories, this, would, this exists as a stark reminder that no, there's something more. There is no reason why every human culture that has ever existed would memorialize its dead unless there was some unique divine part of us that knows death is foreign. Death was not what we were created for. We were created for much more. And Jesus has made that way path possible. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So 
So worldview, what is worldview? Worldview is, there's, there's two primary definitions. One would be more along the lines of apologetics. So you, when you speak of worldview, you speak of defending the faith. And that's not the meaning of worldview that I'm talking about today. The other side is a more comprehensive idea and it's much more internal to every human whereby we have what's akin in a computer world as an operating system, right? So I have a, a Windows, they have a Mac, they each have their own operating system and for us to do anything with them, those operating systems need to be functioning. Well, the worldview that I'm discussing is such for us, and it's in deep internal to us, below our conscious level, and it determines our uh, values, it determines our morals, it determines how we interpret experiences in life, it determines what we like and dislike and uh, communicate in all of those things. And as we will read in these texts, well, let me just read the first one. Um, with that as the basis, this first quote is from Francis Chafer, who many of you probably recognize. He wrote one of many books, but How Should We Then Live? He says this, most people catch their presuppositions from their family and surrounding society the way that a child catches the measles. But people with understanding realize that their presuppositions should be chosen after a careful consideration of which worldview is true. So as we look at some of these survey results, um, you will probably be as disappointed as I was when I saw them about how we are doing as, as Christians in America. Um, and the thesis of this sermon in many ways is it boils down to this idea of our worldview and that many, many Christians are not aware that we have to reconstruct our worldview when we become a Christian. And if we don't, we are going to have a lot of difficulty interpreting what the scripture says versus what we're doing in the world. Um, and this is what Francis Schaeffer uh, is describing. All of us, when we're very, very, very young, we begin to develop our world view through all of the external things in our lives, from our parents, from the family situations, from all of these different um, sources. And so what we end up with is a conglomeration or a potpourri, if you will, of different ideologies, of different um, beliefs that are not congruent with one another and they actually contradict each other in times. And so it's, it's difficult for us to be consistent and also to, to be true. In, in everything that we do because we, we were acting out of different uh, ideologies at different times in, in our daily life. The second thing he says though is for us today, people with understanding, now he's talking to us, he's talking to Christians now, realize that their presuppositions should be chosen after a careful consideration of which worldview is true. So those of you that are academics or that for whatever reason know these things, there's probably eight to 10 identified academic worldviews. And what I mean by that is these are operating systems, if you were, these are beliefs of ideologies that have been rationalized, that have been tested, that have been processed through logic and stand firmly on being um, integrated and being coherent. There's eight to 10 of those, one of which is the biblical worldview. None of them are what you and I have, and none of them are what anybody else has. So those eight are ideal, I, idealist versions, but the goal is for us as humans, and our destiny will provide us in Christ where our ideology is perfectly aligned with the will of God, right? That's the end goal. So that our behavior and our thinking and all the things that come out of that are in perfect alignment with the will of God. This is how and why Jesus lived the perfect life. And it is our destiny and it is part of the gospel message for us to be made, remade, restored 
in the image of God and made into the image of Christ. The second quote is from a gentleman named George Barna. He is the director of an organization called the, Cent the Cultural Center Research Center, Cultural Research Center at uh, the Arizona Christian University. And he is director and uh, author uh, and anal analyst of one of the surveys that we're going to look at. He says this, a biblical worldview is thinking like Jesus. It is a way of making our faith practical to every situation we face each day. A biblical worldview is a way of dealing with the world such that we act like Jesus 24 hours a day. That's pretty straightforward. Um, and it's pretty simple to say. Extremely hard, extremely hard to do. So let's dive into the uh, uh, analysis. So. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So the biblical worldview measured by the Center for, uh, or the Cultural Research Center uh, is this report called the Annual American Worldview Inventory. They do this annually. They've done it now for about five years in a row. And it measures one's worldview through eight categories of beliefs and behaviors. And I'm not going to give a test on this, but I'm going to read through them just to trigger in your mind, do I think about these things? Do I think about my, my worldview, myself, my faith against these types of categories? Number one is the Bible, truth, and morals. Number two, faith practices. Family and the value of life. God, creation, and history. Human character and nature. Lifestyle, behavior, and relationships, purpose and calling, sin, salvation, and God relationships. And if you want a homework assignment, I'll give you more than one. This is one of them, is to, I'll, this will be uploaded at some point, and you can look at these and meditate on them and say, where are my preconceptions on each of these categories? Are they, what are they? What do I think about them? And then, analyze, are those preconceptions biblical or not? Analysis, go ahead and go to the next slide. So that report was released last month, and the 2024 national survey shows that 66% of adults consider themselves to be Christians, and of that group, only 6% of the self-identified Christians possess a biblical worldview. Six percent. That that's shocking to me, um, and and from a from a trend from the five year trend, it's going down. So it was higher last year. Second quote they come out with, most Americans have no idea that they are engaged in philosophical theft or complicit in crafting a worldview that is uniquely theirs. Rather, most adults simply absorb philosophies and practices that feel good, work well, or seem popular in order to help them make choices throughout the day. And this is called syncretism. So syncretism is this idea where um, you, uh, like you're going to go to the grocery store and you're going to go shopping for groceries and you just go down the aisle and you need this and you need this and you need this and you're following instinct and you're following whatever your mind tells you at that moment. Um, it's a, it produces a disjointed and incoherent group of ideologies and we all do it and we're where the world in which we live pushes it on us. It's part of, in my opinion, the strategy of Satan to push this on us. There have never been so many ideologies and so many pathways that Satan has had to blacken our worldview and to, in so doing, keep us from living out a kingdom life. 
Next slide. So then, why don't more Christians have a biblical worldview? Well, I, these are my thoughts. Um, you may come up with five different ones, but these are my five. Number one, it's all about Mike. It, we rule ourselves. And the world, again, coaches us, encourages us, demands us, really, to focus on ourselves. Everything we do is to make me feel happy. And I put that in quotations because it's an emotional response. Happy is whatever that moment calls for. And whatever I need that makes me happy, that is what I would choose in my worldview. Obviously, that's not going to stand against a biblical worldview, right? Two, worldly philosophies control us. Secularism, pluralism, naturalism, more, more recently, social justice. Um, these ideologies govern the media, they govern literature, they govern social media, uh, polit politics, even the workplace. Um, it's, it's hard to escape from the tentacles, if you will, of these ideologies. And it's not that we can't say no, but it's so subtle that many of us don't even know what it is. And so we absorb it and we take it in. These last three I'm going to deal with independently. So biblical illiteracy, theological ignorance, and the idea that our God is too small. So let's go to the next slide. Biblical illiteracy. So this goes to a uh, second um, study put out by Lifeway Research, and it was done on behalf of Ligonier Ministries, those of you that are familiar with that. Uh, it found that 45% of Christians read the Bible once a week, 40% read it one to, twi one to two times a month, and one in five never read it. And again, they also found 6% of Christians have a biblical worldview. So one uh, pastor theologian had this to say about results. He said, many Christians think that reading the Bible is important and they may understand how to read the Bible, but behind the statistics is an even bigger problem. They don't understand why they read. The Bible. And that may sound odd, but this quote that you have in front of you explains it. So in Ephesians, for example, he goes on to say, Paul lays out the why, what Christ has done. I would say the theology of Christ. And then moves to the how, what Christ commands. These are the imperatives of how then shall we live. The why and how is the pattern for the Christian life laid out through the New Testament epistles. First, Bible readers are told who Jesus is and what he has done, and then they are called to obedience to him. The problem is we have reversed the order in Christian growth today. Instead of calling people to understand who Jesus is and what he has done, contemporary Christian literature focuses so much on how we are to do our lives, apart from explaining why we are to do our lives that way. I don't think I read that right. Um, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and, and we're going to be studying Romans uh, next fall. And it's written that way. So the first 11 chapters are, are uh, uh, theology. It's about why. It's about what Jesus has done, why Jesus did it. And then the last chapters are about, okay, so then how shall we live? Colossians, which we're going to look at in a little bit, the same way. The first two chapters, I would, that's one of your other assignments. I would strongly encourage you to read the book of Colossians. It's four chapters. The first two give you the, the highest and cleanest and most succinct Christology, which is a theology of Christ. Uh, in the Bible. And then the last two give you the so then, 
how we should live. That is the way the epistles are written, and they're written that way, not because the human author wanted them to, they're written that way because the divine author wanted them written that way. And he's the one that created us, and he knows how our operating systems need to work. So I believe strongly that we need to get back to knowing the why of what we are to do. Next slide. Theological ignorance. Same study. One in five Christians believe there are multiple ways to heaven. 59% of Christians believe the Holy Spirit is a force, not a person. 6% have a biblical word. It's the last time I'll say it. Four, 46% of evangelicals believe people are basically good. Five, 42% believe God accepts worship of all religions. Six, 65% believe people are born innocent. Seven, the statement God learns and adapts to different circumstances. 57% agree with that statement. 47% disagree. The statement Jesus was a great teacher but was not God. 46% agree with that statement. 54% disagree. And then lastly, everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. 61% agree. Let that sink in for a little bit. Those are stark numbers. And I am not picking on anybody <laughs> in this room uh, or listening to me online. This is national surveys. It's a state of the national evangelical movement. What do they consider? These are the four criteria that the respondents strongly agree with to be considered a Christian. Number one, the Bible is the highest authority for what I believe. Number two, it is very important for me personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus Christ as their savior. Number three, Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of my sin. And number four, only those who trust in Christ Jesus alone as their savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. All of those tenets would agree with what we have in our heritage statement of faith. Last of the five of why we don't have good worldviews is our God is too small. And many of you would, are familiar with this classic written by J.B. Phillips, Your God is Too Small. This is a book that's 40 or 50 years old. And in it, he caricatures six different ways standard people, Christians, view God the Father. And so I thought it was telling, I thought it was, it was succinct, and so I'm just gonna give you those six with his short explanation for them. And again, this is how a Christian would think of God the Father. Number one, a resident policeman. People see God only through their conscience, their view of right and wrong. So when they're faced with a moral decision, that is when they would think of God the Father. Two, the parental hangover. They would, uh, a person would strongly correlate their earthly father's traits to the heavenly father's traits. Three, the grand old man. The perception that we have learned for those of us that were raised in the church as a little child, we still carry those same ideas and think of God the Father in the same childish ways. Four, meek and mild. This gross mischaracterization of, of Jesus and also of God, it still permeates Christianity. Um, five, the heavenly bosom. So here, the way it's described, escapist understanding that we should be free from life's troubles, sufferings, and pain. Um, I'll put that in my own words. Basically, our world tells us we shouldn't suffer at all. Even the tiniest little bit of discomfort we need to remedy, we need to fix, we need 
to do something to resolve it. And yet, all of us in this room know God uses suffering. He sometimes puts us in suffering. Why? To discipline us, to exercise love, to correct us, to grow and mature us. So he's not always going to pick us up in his arms and hold us against his bosom and comfort us, which is what this view is. And then six, a managing director. Here, we view God as a magnified human. So we uh, each personally have traits of a person that we think are excellent and we want to emulate. And so God is that. He's just better at it. He's higher than we are, right? So there's truth in all six of these, but there's a lot of falseness in all of them as well. And so my summary statement is number seven. All of us have warped views of God. Only through the word and spirit and church can we deconstruct and reconstruct a correct view. And if we don't have a correct view of God, we're not going to have a correct view of the world or our worldview. So that ends the analysis section of the teaching. It's a wake-up call. Uh, it's, it's not the first wake-up call the church has had. We have them regularly. Um, but what, what where we're moving forward to now is trying to address how can we be exhorted? What can we do? How then shall we live? And so the first thing I want to do is approach this issue right here. Your God is too small. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So a few of you may recognize this. Most of you probably won't. This is a 3D map of the known universe. Um, it is currently 13.8 billion light years across, and it is expanding. In that map, there is an estimated 2 trillion galaxies. God is bigger than that universe. And we learn in Colossians 1, not only is, is God bigger, but Jesus, on the throne that he is on in the heaven, actually sustains everything in that universe, everything on this galaxy, on this planet, in this church, in each one of us. That's how big God is. I exhort all of us to expand our understanding of how big God really is. He, out, he lives outside that universe and inside it. He pre-existed it and he will exist after it. So let's double click on that a little bit. Go ahead and go to the next slide. This is a spiral galaxy that we have taken a picture of here on Earth. Um, we can't take a picture of our own, the Milky Way, because it's too far for us to get outside of it and then come back and look at it and take a picture. So somebody that's very smart took an, uh, an approximate model of what the Milky Way would look like or does look like and drew where we would be on that, in that galaxy. Those of you that know a little bit about creationism um, would know that that, lo that precise location of where we're at in this galaxy is very unique and it's very anthropomorphic, meaning centered about man. It allows us to, go, to, to be able to map the galaxy on the slide before. It allows us to see the heavens with unbelievable clarity because of our location. It's not behind clouds. It's out in an area where we have clear visibility of the universe. It's phenomenal how precisely located we are in this galaxy. But that's where we are. And now the next slide. Those of you familiar with, uh, maybe familiar with this picture, um, you have to tr look very hard, but you'll see a little tiny blue dot in that white ray. 
that white ray is sunlight. This picture was taken by Voyager. Those of you, how many know what Voyager is? Or, okay, so those of us that are my age. Uh, so Voyager, Voyager was launched in 1990, and it, this was its last picture, and it was 3.7 billion miles away from Earth, and it looked back and took a picture, the first picture of our whole solar system. All of the planets and the sun were in this picture. And this particular uh, uh, pixel selection of that picture shows the Earth as this tiny little blue dot. And this became famous with Carl Sagan and his pale blue dot book. And how by looking at this, he was moved to see the fragility of our planet and moved to cry out for everyone to protect the earth and not to destroy it. Um, but my, my purpose here is to help us see the difference between Mike and God. And so if you look at this planet versus the universe, which is God is bigger than the universe. And then that planet is all of this earth, right? So there's 8 billion people on this earth. Mike is one of those 8 billion people on that little sphere. And God, who's bigger than the universe, calls me by name and died for me and called me to be a part of this local church and has a plan for my life and your life. That's how big God is. So let, let us meditate in whatever way you can to expand our heart and our mind and especially our worldview on how huge this God is. Next slide. Um, we've we talked about the why and the how in the epistles, and that part of the problem with biblical illiteracy, part of the problem with theological ignorance is not, not enough focus on the why. So I'm going to show you really quickly um, how that would look. And if I had more time, I would spend a little time exegeting some stuff. But. I strongly and, 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 and exhort all of us to think of the kingdom of God as a preferred meta narrative in understanding and contextualizing the Bible. And that's not that any of the other ones are bad, um, but the kingdom of God is not as, this is going to sound odd, it's not as polluted. Um, the more theologians play with things, the more it gets polluted. And the kingdom of God is relatively new onto the theological landscape. And so it's fresh, and I think it's actually more biblical than, say, redemption, salvation. Most of us, my age, have been raised with this idea that the Christian faith is about salvation. It's about um, accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord. We then receive his righteousness and we are forgiven our sins. We are in relationship with God and we have entry into heaven. There's nothing wrong with that. Everything about that is true. But that unfortunately is where, at least for me, that's where my teaching stopped. And for most of us in churches, that's the focus. And that's not what Jesus' focus was. Jesus' was focus was on what? It was on the kingdom. And the kingdom is a part of, or is, includes all of those parts to it. But all of those parts were a means to an end for the plan of God. And I unfortunately don't have time to go into the plan of God. Luckily for you, not for me, but let me, uh, <laughs> let me just show you what I mean. So I'm going to look at these uh, texts in Luke really quickly and just 
show you what they mean from a, a biblical standpoint or a kingdom of God standpoint. Definition is very, very simple. The kingdom of God represents God's rule of God's people in God's prepared place. So you can go back to the Garden of Eden. You can go back to the Promised Land. You can go to Revelation 22. These are all um, actualizations of this idea of a kingdom. And the kingdom of God is prevalent throughout the Old Testament. And um, you're just going to have to take my word on that because we don't have time to go through it. But let me look at Luke 1, 32. So Gabriel, the angel has come to Mary, is telling her, uh, you will conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now Mary, along with every other person in Israel, would know that's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Everyone like Mary in Israel would know this is the Messiah. We don't, you know, we're not shocked by that statement because we read it every year. Mary was shocked. A, there was a high fervor among uh, Israel for the coming of the Messiah. They had Daniel. They could count the, the days. I mean, they had it mapped out. They knew the time was near. So this was a sign that the kingdom of God was coming. And it wasn't that the kingdom hadn't been in existence before. It's just they didn't have access to the kingdom. What happened in the Garden of Eden? They got kicked out. They no longer had access to the kingdom. The Promised Land, they never really got full access, right? They went out onto the wilderness. God was with them physically, but they were in constant rebellion against him. And they never realized the full benefits of the kingdom of God. And then in the Promised Land, they just slowly hardened, hardened their hearts. But through all of that, Jesus was born. That was all part of his plan. And here it comes to Mary. Chapter 4, the first thing that God does through Jesus, the first thing Jesus does, is what? He goes, driven by the Holy Spirit, he goes out and fights Satan. So... Theologically, what's going on, Satan is the ruler, the prince of this air. He is the prince of the earth. He is the ruling authority. This is his land. For Jesus to have authority over Satan, to have authority over the, his demons, to have authority over his people, which would be us, he had to defeat the ruler. So first thing he does is, do, is defeat Satan. Then his authority supersedes the authority of Satan. Does that make sense? The next, the rest of chapter four deals with uh, what Jesus was doing um, in, in, on the slide. He spoke with authority. So the people had never heard a teacher, a rabbi speak with authority. It was foreign to them. But not only, and you, you know this, we as humans know it, it's not just you understand it, you perceive it with your mind and the words that are you're hearing. You sense it, you physically, it's palatable when someone is speaking with authority, right? And so Jesus would have had that. The demons obeyed him. And then lastly, let me just read to you um, Verses 40 through 44. This was, he, just, he just healed Simon's mother-in-law. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he lays his hands on every one of them, 
and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed. So he worked from sundown to sunup, healing everybody. The people sought him out and came to him and, and would have kept him from leaving. But he said to them this, I must preach the good news of salvation, of redemption. No, the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For that was why I was sent. And in him, what we find is it's not just the invitation. He actually is the kingdom. He bestows the kingdom, he invites it. He brings it from on high in heaven to earth through himself. So, and then Matthew 5 through 7, we won't look at, but that's another assignment you can do. Read through that and, and think it through from the kingdom of God. It's, it's Jesus defining what the kingdom of God looks like. Summary, number seven, the kingdom was central to Jesus' teachings. Kingdom was why he came. Jesus brings access to the kingdom with him from on high. Miracles, power over demons, preaching, all express kingdom is inaugurated. And the kingdom of heaven now penetrates or permeates and exists in the physical. Oops. I lost my place. Okay, next slide. So, Kingdom of God summary, a, a couple of quotes here. One from Malcolm Muggeridge. Jesus' good news then was that the Kingdom of God had come and that he, Jesus, was its herald and expounder to men. More than that, in some special, mysterious way, he was the Kingdom. And to amplify that a little bit, the, the Kingdom is about authority. And we in America and in Southern Oregon are anti-authority. Um, and yet you, you have to submit and understand God's authoritative profile and, and how he created creation with levels of authority to understand and have a biblical worldview. This next quote is from uh, Dallas Willard in his book, Divine Conspiracy. When we submit what and where we are to God, our rule or dominion increases. In Jesus' words from the parable of the talents, our master says, well done. You were faithful with a few things and I will put you in charge of many things. Share what your Lord enjoys. So what, what uh, Willard is saying um, prior to this, each one of us, he says, and I would concur, we are given a certain dominion. We have a certain part of our life that we get to say things over. So I have this little portion of my life where I'm the king or you're the queen, right? We all have them and we get to decide, what am I gonna eat? Where am I gonna go today? When am I gonna get up? All of those types of decisions we make without even thinking. But it's our little domain. Unfortunately, we all also want bigger and bigger domains. We want other people's domains. We want to rule bigger things. And so we become self-centered and we become autonomous and we make decisions that cross over into God's domain, right? So when we can submit our small little domain, the, the, the humanness of Mike, and I can submit that to the Father's will and submit that to his reign, then this parable takes place and God actually increases my reign because then he can trust me with a larger portion of his reign. A couple other comments on this from Dallas Willard. The gospel of the kingdom the good news of the kingdom 
is the realm of God's active goodness informing us in Christ as we follow him. The kingdom of God is grand, majestic, and full of beauty. We come to understand the kingdom by repenting and simply believing, or I'm sorry, simply becoming apprentices of Jesus in his kingdom. But this apprenticeship model, we call it mentoring, we call it discipleship, doesn't exist outside of the kingdom of God. And then lastly this, to enter into the fullness of human life as God intended it, and thus become the kind of person we would expect from looking at Jesus and his teachings, requires us to live our lives in the kingdom of God. Living in the kingdom of God is an active pursuit. It's not a passive gift. Many Christians think it's a passive gift like salvation. We don't do anything for salvation. It's all done for us, right? This is not. The, 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 the verbs that are used, the imperatives are active, personal action. We are too, and we'll look at this briefly in Colossians. Next slide. So let's quickly look at Colossians. And if you want to turn there, um, you can go to Colossians 3. You don't need to. I'm not going to read all of this, but uh, I do want to highlight this worldview in correlation with what our identity is. We each all are familiar with identity, self-identity. Um, we all have one. Um, it changes, you know, but one of the things we have to remember theologically is who we are in Christ. And if we don't think theologically in our daily lives, we, f we, we don't live in the identity that we are in Christ. And if you want to know who you are in Christ, read Colossians. And, and specifically, um, again, chapters 1 through 2 will tell you what he has done and why. And then chapters 3 and 4 will tell you then how shall you live. But the transition is what I want to read. So at the beginning of chapter 3, it transitions. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So on the slide, I summarize this by saying we have died with Christ and been raised with him. We have a supernatural union with Christ. We are therefore exhorted to set our minds on the things above, not on the things of earth. And if you're like me, you can't go very long in this world without having some level of an interruption from the world, right? Whether it's my wife or work, or I'm just kidding, Cindy. Uh, we're bombarded, uh, our phones, um, with interruptions in our life. We have to be disciplined and set time aside to reflect and to set our minds on the things above. We've got to feed that part of ourself that is being molded and shaped into the image of Christ. And that includes our worldview. If we don't set that time aside, that growth, that transformation won't work. The next section that Paul goes into then is verse five. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, what, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Verse eight, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. 
These verbs, these imperatives are on us. We need to take off the old self and put on the new self. We, through the work of Christ, Christ, part of his cosmic scope is he has created a new humanity. We are all born into the family of Adam and through accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord or using the way Paul said it here, if you then have been raised with Christ, which we're going to celebrate here shortly, if then you have been raised, you are now a new creation. You are an adopted son and daughter of God and you are free from all of the entanglements that we have in Adam and in Satan. But we have to take that off. And then we have to put on the new Adam or, the, or, or, or uh, Jesus's image, right? We take off the image of Adam, we take off our old stuff, and we put on the kingdom. We put on the values, the ethics, the face of Jesus. We dress like Jesus. That's on us to do. And then verses 13 uh, or 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Those are the attributes. Those are the attitudes. That's the disposition of one walking with Jesus. So I kind of covered all of those things. Number five here, God joined us to Jesus. So when Jesus died, he went to hell or he went to death. He was raised, he was resurrected, he ascended, he now reigns, and we have followed him in that path. We now are seated with him in the heavenlies. So we share in his death, his burial, his resurrection, ascension, his righteousness, and his inheritance. These are all awarded to the new humanity he has created. This now defines us. Our identity, our presuppositions, our worldview, these all need to catch up to who we are theologically, to who Jesus has made us. But that takes work. That takes our effort. The Spirit, the Word will support us in that process. But we have to put our foot forward. We have to put our shoulder to the work and, and do it. So then, how shall we live? Well, we just read a really good summary from Paul, but let me just add a couple points, and I'll be quick. Number one, develop a regular time for gospel reflection. Evaluating your life against the kingdom. So you need to know what the kingdom's ethics and values are. You need to be disciplined to set aside regular time, but assess yourself. You've got the tools. Ultimately, don't assess them to what I was showing you. Assess them to this and let the Spirit guide and direct you. Two, and this is correlates with it, daily feed on the Word and the Spirit. Our, our presuppositions and our worldview are underneath our consciousness, but they need to be fed. They were birthed in a fallenness. They were birthed in a fallen world. Christ is going to redeem them. But for us to walk and grow maturely in him, we have to be a part of that process. And it takes daily feeding. Three, understand and submit to the authority structure of the kingdom. I do not have time to, to expo exposit that. Um, but if you read through uh, Matthew 5 through 7, you'll get, a, you'll get a pretty good flavor of it. And if you read Colossians 1 and 2, you'll get an excellent exposure to it. Four, 
change your expectations of life and life's experiences based on the why we're talking about and your new identity. It's changed. Your identity's changed. Your heart is changing. So your values, your attitudes, your behaviors, your thoughts are all changing. You need to in be, be strategic and intentional about promoting that change and change your expectations about everything, about God, about your spouse, about your family, about your work, about church, about yourself. Everything is changed when it's in, put against the light of the gospel and the kingdom. And then finally, five, develop a disciplined life. And I've got uh, six different ways here. A, Philippians 4.8, change things in your life to pursue things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. Cut out what isn't. And if you don't know, ask somebody what those things are or, or use some of the Bible tools that we have. Um, that's what you need to focus on. That's what you need to fill your life with. Not the other things, not the things of this world. B, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, Philippians 4.4. 4. And this is a command, and it's not that we rejoice when we're happy. It's when we're sad. It's when we're devastated. It's when we've lost a loved one. It's when we have been given uh, uh, notice that we have an incurable disease. It's those times that Paul is talking about rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Those of you that like to read the Psalms know that Paul or David often speaks to his soul, right? He encourages himself theologically. That's what this is. If you, if you in that dark moment can reach out and rejoice that God is God and you are his son and daughter, you have overcome. You are an overcomer, and, and you will be blessed greatly because of that. C, discipline your body and mind, whether it's fasting, whether it's exercising, whether it's changing what you take in from entertainment or social media. You, you, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's that simple. And all of our senses, all of our things are related. We are a holistic creation. We want to take care of our whole thing. And if we don't govern our bodies and our spirits and our hearts with our, with our will um, and our worldview, then we are no better than the pagans following our cravings, following our passions, right? And, and this is Paul's point here. We have to take control. I, Mike, have to take control of Mike, which includes all of that, and commit that, submit that to the kingdom. D, develop a comprehensive theology. I think I've spoke about that enough. E, be active at church. So I'm a strong believer that the local church is the outpost of the kingdom of God in very specific space slash time domains. And so all over the world, there's, there's churches like Heritage. And God has placed them there, and God sustains them. And I, I view Revelation 1, where, where John has the vision of Jesus and the, and the uh, lampstand, where he is sustaining those churches. Um, I, as, as an individual believer and my family, need to be connected to an outpost. We are enemies in a foreign land. We're, we're behind the enemy lines, if you will. We need community. We need support to make it, to grow and mature and be effective living our lives in the kingdom. And then lastly, join a small group. Be a part of mentoring and being mentored. It is a phenomenal growth opportunity where the Holy Spirit and the Word transform people before each other's eyes and they live life together and they support one another. And I know many of you are a part of that. So uh, lean into 
community. Summing all this up, I want to close with a quote from C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. So he calls this dressing up like Christ, i.e. being made into the image of Christ. He says this, the real Son of God is at your side. He is beginning to turn you into the same kind of thing as himself. He is beginning, so to speak, to inject his kind of life and thought into you, beginning to turn the tin soldier into a live man. The part of you that doesn't, does not like it is the part that is still tin. We need to be able to differentiate the tin from the living and continue to grow the living and shrink the tin. Let me close in prayer. Father, this is uh, a lot of information. Um, and I just pray that your spirit help each one of us individually take away from it what you want and um, apply it in ways that are honorable and um, praiseworthy and uh, glory bringing to our King, uh, Jesus the Christ, your Son and our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.